Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful spring day. Um, so I'm Dr. Davidicus Wong, and I've been giving these empowering patients talks with the uh, irreplaceable help of Leona, Leona Cullen, who's here with us as well. Leona is very active in doing a lot of management in the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. So I'd like to invite Leona to tell you about some resources on the chat and to remind you about our next big event, which is the big event of the year, our walk with your doc. So that'll be May 6th coming up on a Saturday. So guaranteed nice weather and a good <laughs> turnout. And in addition to myself, there'll be a lot of my colleagues who are out there to encourage physical activity and to connect with you without needing any mess outdoors uh, for physical activity and to let us let you know that we care about you, we care about our community, and we want to create a healthier community together. So uh, on to Leona. Hi, thanks everybody for um, for coming out tonight. And uh, thanks, Dr. Wong, you're always so kind. Um, I love this work and, and I love that we're going to continue doing it next year. Um, so I'm going to pop, as Dr. Wong said, pop a few links into the chat for you. The first one's going to be our Empowering Patients program uh, page. It's our main page and it includes upcoming events, which unfortunately this is the last of the season, except for Walk With Your Doc on May the 6th. This is the last of this session, but we are going to go into planning mode over the summer. Um, and uh, so just watch that page for uh, the fall and winter uh, schedule. Um, the second one um, link is going to be all the resources of the talks that Dr. Wong and I have, have um, put on over the past few years. So Dr. Wong uh, develops the, the um, key points documents, so information sheets, and he also is kind enough to share the presentation for each talk. So you have, have those available to you. So that's in the second link. The third link is for the our Burnaby Primary Care Networks page, which is all the collaborative work that we do with the health authority and community partners. So there's many, many services and resources now available in Burnaby. It's kind of exclusive to Burnaby. Um, we um, we're, we're, we do a lot of strong work and, and um, it's really powerful to see the impact we can have in the community working together with our partners. So I'm gonna pop that link in there. Um, the next one is in within the PCN or primary care network um, field, and that's Doc Talk. So it's another um, series of uh, health talks done by other doctors in Burnaby. The most recent one was on the April 11th, and that was um, what you should do if your doctor retires. So um, I did just look, and the the recording for that session is not not up on the site yet. But if you bookmark it, you can go back, and that recording will be there. So there's really important information. Um, uh, if you're looking for a family doctor in Burnaby and you're a Burnaby resident, I'm going to pop the patient attachment link into um, the chat. Uh, it gives you an overview of the program and um, how to get yourself added to the wait list. And I'm not going to lie, the wait list is significant, but our team is working really hard to ensure that we get everybody matched to either a family doctor or a nurse practitioner, because that is an option. Um, next, um, we've got a new monthly publication that's used to be our COVID roundup. We, that was a weekly uh, publication. We've now gone monthly, but we've made, made it more broad in that we include vetted news articles, um, community events, and all, all the things that we do in the partnership is now coming in this monthly newsletter. So be sure to subscribe. I'm going to put the April edition in there for you to check out and you can subscribe from within the publication. And lastly, I'll wrap up by saying, please um, take a moment to complete our uh, survey. It's a, just an evaluation of the talk. Um, and uh, Dr. Wong and I really value your feedback. So please be honest and share what you can. And um, yeah, I, if you're not already on our mailing list, there's an opportunity there to leave your email. Um, if you already get emails from me, you don't need to, but if you have, don't and you'd like to, be sure to leave your email. And that's it. I hope to see you on May, to, May the 6th in person at Walk With Your Doc. Thanks, Dr. Wong. Great. Thanks, Leona. So the topic today is what you should know about medical ethics. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Leona will read them up to me at the end so we can have some time at the end to explore any questions you might have about medical ethics. And I'm sure you have plenty, at least at the end of our discussion. So this talk, as you know, is brought to you by the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. And you have those links to our website so you can hear about all the great things that Leona and the rest of our team have been doing for our community. 
So why are we here? This is familiar to all of you that have come to our empowering preaching talks over the last few years, but it's always good to start to remind you that, of course, as a family doctor, we care about our patients and we care about our community. So that's why I, I don't mind devoting time outside of the busy office hours to, to share information that I think is really important, not only to my patients, but pretty well all of us, things that, that we should know, but often we don't have time to talk about during those busy times in the office or in the hospital. And together we care about the future, the future of the Burnaby community, about our children, about our elders, and you're a part of that circle caring as well. I'm hoping that uh, uh, knowing how much we care about you and the community, that you'll meet us for the walk with your doc, share information that you find is useful to the people you care about as well. So if you get a few really good pearls from today's talk, please, share it with the people you connect with, neighbors, friends, and family. So as a reminder, walk with your doc. Everyone is invited, but register early so that you can get a free gift. So I'm not sure what the free gift is this year, but it was really nice fanny bags last year that I found really useful. So I'll be talking about why ethics matters, because a lot of people think it sounds very academic or philosophical, but it has relevance to pretty well everything that I do and every interaction you have with a healthcare provider. And I'll make it really clear about the ethical principles that they're just not concepts, but they actually guide what I do every day. And we'll talk about preventive ethics, like preventive medicine that help prevent a lot of heartache and problems. And a new addition is talking about MAID, medical assistance in death, which is a uh, a new process, so I'll give you some updates on what's involved with that in case it applies to anyone that you know. So first, you'll see a little bit some quiz questions. So you don't have to put up your hands, but just give the answer in your own mind. So multiple choice. Bioethics relates to A, telling the truth in a celebrity biography, or B, treating animals humanely, or C, medical ethics. So if you guessed C, you're right. So medical ethics is the application of ethical principles to healthcare. And the four principles of bioethics that I'll go through in some good detail to make it clear in plain language are, number one, non-maleficence, to do no harm. The second rule is beneficence, to do good. That's why I signed up for this. Autonomy, to respect the patient's choices, justice to be fair and to treat like cases alike, and confidentiality, respecting an individual's personal information as much as possible. So the, uh, these are the big principles, the five big principles of bioethics. So dilemmas arise, or problems making decisions arise in particular cases where these principles conflict. For example, We'd like to respect an individual to make their own decision, but in some cases, some people might be putting themselves or others at risk. So how do we decide? And in general, a treatment that we apply or can offer is considered appropriate to the individual if the potential benefits of the procedure or the operation or the medication outweighs the potential burdens. Those are the risks and the side effects of that treatment uh, or that course or that surgery or the medication. And that has to be from that individual's point of view, not necessarily what the healthcare provider or other people might think. So that's a general thing to know that a particular treatment or drug is not always the right thing for every condition. And it's only when it's appropriate for that individual based on potential benefits outweighing the potential burdens. And it's always the patient's choice when they're able to make a decision. For example, life support, like doing CPR, um, being on a respirator or artificial feeding through a feeding tube is appropriate if it provides an acceptable quality of life. And, and that has to be judged from that individual patient's perspective. Um, oftentimes when people are on life support, they can't speak for themselves, they might be unconscious. So that's why preventive bioethics is so important so that we think, ask, and think and consider what we want, what our loved ones want, if they were to be in that situation. So that's why I would like you to be thinking ahead about 
scenarios where you may not be able to make your decision, but how do you make your wishes known in the present so that your loved ones and those making decisions for you will know what you would want to do in those situations? So second question, true or false? Bioethics has more to do with philosophy rather than the day-to-day -day work of healthcare. So I kind of hinted what the answer that is. So obviously it's false. Medical ethics is really the foundation of everything that we do. So our tests and treatments are merely tools and it's ethics that guide us in their appropriate use. So third question, autonomy is A, the economics of the automobile industry, or B, a Tomorrowland attraction in Disneyland where kids can drive futuristic cars oddly powered by gasoline engines. Maybe they've changed it since they last went to Disneyland, but last time it was gas powered. Or is it C, the ability to make independent decisions? So if you guess C, that autonomy is the ability for you to make independent decisions, give yourself a thumbs up and a high five. And Last question, the single greatest threat to your autonomy is A, the healthcare system, B, big brother, doctors and nurses, or your family? Well, sometimes it's B, your family. If you're in a condition such that you were no longer capable of directing your own healthcare decisions, say if you had a stroke or you're unable to speak or you're unconscious and you had not made it clear to what your preferences were, about particular treatments, like as feeding tubes or breathing machines or respirators, or resuscitation if your heart stopped or you stopped breathing, then your family members, like the kids, could be in conflict with one another, or they might make a decision based on what they want rather than what you would want. So that's why we want to have these conversations early, so that it doesn't cause a lot of stress and conflict to your family members, and also to ensure that your wishes are going to be respected. Oh, this is the final question, true or false? Most ethical dilemmas are unavoidable. So why bother thinking about them? So obviously that's false. With proactive reflection and discussion, now you can make your choices clear for when they're needed in the future. So ethics is not abstract philosophy. It's not just for students, academics, and older people. Just like thinking about the meaning of life. So most people don't think about the meaning of life or reflect on ethics until they really need to, until there's some emergency like a crisis or, or a loss or midlife. Um, so some people wait until that crisis before they think about it. But it's really important to keep looking um, at what your values are and how to make clear decisions. It's like using a map and making sure you know which way the compass is pointing. Otherwise, we might be diverted by detours and distractions and end up in a place far from where we want to be. We might find ourselves far from our destination. And uh, some of us, at least half of us, are less inclined to ask for directions, as most wives and girlfriends know. So, uh, I think you should think about ethics every day. It applies to every time you interact with a healthcare provider. So it's pretty well, I'm thinking about it as a healthcare provider every day, all the time. For an example is confidentiality in the doctor's office. So it's not unusual for a parent to ask, hey, did my daughter have an appointment earlier today? And uh, what did she talk about? What did the doctor talk about? So if your daughter's an adult, then obviously they don't have any business knowing if they came in today or not. And that's something that the staff needs to keep confidential. And even if the daughter or the son is a teenager, so still a minor, but if it's something personal and they're capable of making decisions on their own, we still would respect that child's confidentiality that's considered mature minor. And sometimes uh, a uh, husband or wife might call and ask about the details of the patient's medical condition, and I'm not allowed to disclose it unless it's quite clear to me, either verbally or in writing from the patient, that we're allowed to discuss confidential matters with a family member. So I might end up calling that patient just to say that, oh, 
your brother is inquiring about your health, what do you permit me to, to share with them or share anything at all? Now, sometimes a family member might call to share information with the doctor that would be really important. And then sometimes they ask us not to share with that individual. So that's really difficult if we're going to take that into account. Um, but you could share information. So if if a family member or a friend is um, doing or doing things that are not helpful for their health, or you have serious concerns about them or their cognition or decision making ability, um, you you should report that to the to your family doctor or to the family doctor so that they have that information. It would be easier if you allow us to share that information with the individual as well, but uh, in some cases that it may be appropriate to keep it confidential too. Another aspect of informed consent is that any test that we order, even a simple blood test, should not be ordered without your clear consent. That's why when I talk about lab tests with a patient about tests that we should order, I just don't give them a form and not explain to them what every little checkbox or thing I've written on it is for, what those tests are for. Because you don't want to be ordering tests that the patient did not request. Because actually, technically and legally and ethically, it's considered battery for someone to order a procedure or a test on you without your consent. And the other part of informed consent is that as a healthcare provider, as a doctor, um, that I may have to make sure that I gave you the key information that you need to know to make a clear decision. And I'll talk about what those key things we all need to know in order to make a good decision. So back to those individual principles of medical ethics. So in plain words, beneficence is to do good. And that's why I decided to be a doctor because I wanted to help other people um, to learn and practice and to be skilled and be able to, to be kind of a coach and a guide to help my patients achieve their best um, health and best quality of life and to help them negotiate the complex healthcare system. So that's why we sign up to be healthcare providers, to do good, beneficence. The primary goal of medicine is to help individual patients. But of course, the first rule of medicine is to do no harm. So above all else, do no harm. That's what non-maleficence is. And you know that potentially any drug or any procedure has potential for harm and risks. But we try to minimize that and to also inform the patient in advance when they're making decisions to know what the potential risks are. And justice means treating like cases alike, so being fair. So our golden rule of medicine, at least in my practice, that we have this kind of posted at the front desk where the patients don't see it is actually right along the ledge where my medical office assistants can see. So Christine and Helen see this every day. Our golden rule of medicine is to treat every patient with the same care and consideration that we would expect for our best friend and family member. So I use the same specialists, give the same level of thought, same medications, and try to get things done in the same amount of speed as I would want for a family member or a best friend. And the principle of confidentiality is respecting a patient's private information. So very relevant in this age of uh, computers, um, medical records being stored not on paper, but on a computer record. And the reason why it's so important is if you didn't know that I was gonna keep things confidential, then you wouldn't share really important information that I would need to know to provide you the best care. So I need to know enough information, um, all your habits, any other medications that you're taking or if you're using other recreational drugs or drinking, I would need to know that, but people might be a bit shy about sharing that, but it's really important for your doctor to know because there can be interactions or other issues and what we recommend based on that information. So that's why you need to be assured of confidentiality. But there are certain conditions that you should know about when your confidentiality can be breached. Um, so one of them is this legal duty to protect. So that's if you as a patient pose a serious threat to other people. 
Um, so a really difficult one is when we determine that a patient is no longer able to drive because of visual impairment or because of dementia that's affecting their judgment and reaction time or some other physical disability that prevents them from operating a motor vehicle safely because we have a, a duty to protect the public from the harm um, that could be caused if you're not fit to drive. So I don't know if you know about that, but anyone can report to you to the uh, OSMV, Office of the Motor Vehicle Safety in, in Victoria. So if someone, if you think your neighbor is no longer fit to drive because they keep on uh, driving into solid objects in your neighborhood, uh, or you have serious concerns, you can report that. And then the OSMV will send a notice to that individual that they need to see a medical doctor to determine whether or not they're safe to drive. So that goes for family members too. So it's sometimes difficult to bring up or keep on hiding the keys, but if you have a, a family member that's not safe to drive, then you have a personal duty to report it. But as a physician, I need to follow up and determine that things are safe. Also in issues of child protection, if we have reason to believe that a child's well-being is at risk, from physical or emotional abuse, we have a duty to report that to social services. And you probably did know that certain sexually transmitted infections, there's a requirement to report that to the center of disease control. So if I order a test for uh, an STD, like chlamydia or gonorrhea, the center for disease control actually gets informed if someone has a positive result. And they will contact us just to make sure that either we are taking responsibility for following up with contacts, because that could be spread to other people that are partners with the individual with the infection, or we will provide the contact information to the Center for Disease Control so that they can contact the individual and, and track down the contacts. So it's something people are not always aware of. And the other condition would be a court order. So the court legally requires us to turn over some records. So that's sometimes if there's some legal case, sometimes that's required specific records would be required or some criminal cases, which is very rare. And if I'm, so minors and others who cannot give informed consent, who are not capable of understanding uh, all the details of their medical condition and the choices such that they can make a decision. So we would involve the, the guardians or uh, their family members, the parents, to share in the information and be the decision makers. So in the day-to-day -day things, who has access to your records? So obviously your physician and the medical staff have access. But my medical office assistant doesn't read all the notes that we discuss, only if it's relevant to her job. So I send her information about referrals, uh, results, uh, when we need to call patients about following up with results. But they're not pouring over these details um, that we share when uh, during counseling visits, for example. And they are professionals and they, they keep the same principles of confidentiality and respecting and not discussing things outside. Third parties, if you give them written consents or with a court order, legally required, such as insurance companies like ICBC or WorkSafe or lawyers can access some of your records as well. So if you sign a consent, I'd like you to read it very carefully that it doesn't pertain to all your medical records that don't have anything to do with a particular court case or an accident. So if you're signing a consent, look carefully for the dates of those records that are involved and the nature of those records, whether they relate to all records for that time period or just those that are relevant to the injury or the accident. So be careful about signing consent so you know what you are signing. And of course, other healthcare providers who are involved in your care, uh, such as when you're in the hospital, there'll be many people on the hospital teams, including allied healthcare providers. Certainly the nurses, they all have access to your records. And it includes any specialist that I might refer you to. Uh, I will give them a summary 
of your medical history, the relevant history regarding what we're referring you to for, and also your history of allergies and your medications. They don't have access to see all of your records, only the relevant information that I send with that specialist request. Um, so let me know if you have any particular questions that I can address at the end about uh, confidentiality and who has access to your records. So again, autonomy is the right of the capable individual to direct his own healthcare. And you have the right to refuse any treatment. So it may not be a decision that other people would choose, but you always have a right to refuse treatment. But you don't have a right to demand treatment that is not appropriate or not available. So if there's a particular type of surgery or a particular procedure or drug that's not appropriate for your condition or indicated for your condition, you cannot insist on it. It has to be medically appropriate. And that's why in some cases, the doctors in the hospital could write an order, do not resuscitate, if you're in such a condition that certainly you would not be able to be resuscitated, like if your condition was such that you would not be successful. So informed consent, uh, is there, for you to make an informed decision, you need number one, enough information, the appropriate information to make that decision. And you also need to be mentally capable of understanding that information and making an informed decision. So of course, if you were suffering, if you're unconscious, you couldn't do that. If you're suffering from advanced dementia and couldn't really understand the details of your condition, or the different choices, um, then you would not be able to provide informed consent. So in terms of the information we provide, it has to be enough information about, again, the benefits, the risks, and the alternatives of a test or a procedure, like an operation or a drug before you can choose or refuse it. Um, and of course, due to illness or incapacity, you may not be able to give informed consent. So who will decide on your behalf? So one of my big jobs for 13 years at Burnaby Hospital uh, was chairing the Burnaby Hospital's Ethical Resources Committee. So in, for over 10 years, uh, we actually consulted on ethical dilemmas that arose in real patients in the hospital. Uh, many of the times it was uh, in the emergency department or in the intensive care unit or in long-term care where people had really difficult decisions. The patient was no longer able to speak for themselves due to a stroke, or due to advanced dementia, and they were make, needing to help in making decisions about continuing particular treatments, um, like a feeding tube or other forms of life support. And we were, would be called in if there was conflict between family members and the healthcare team. So um, pretty well all of the cases that uh, I, I consulted on with their ethical resources team for patients that weren't able to make decisions. Uh, and it wasn't clear what the patient would have chosen. So we would have to work together with the family members and healthcare providers to determine either what the patient would have chosen based on their values or what they said in the past. In these cases, there wasn't any living will or event directive to refer to. Um, or determining if that wasn't available what is in the best interest of the patient. So John Milton, the uh, classical poet wrote, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And after doing so many consultations, I said the road to ICU is paved with clinical practice guidelines. So if someone comes in with a stroke, sometimes the immediate thing we would do if someone can't swallow is put in or drink is put in intravenous fluids and knowing that that's not enough to sustain them. If they're still not able to eat things by mouth or give consent, then they might end up with a feeding tube to provide them with sustenance. And we treat every infection according to protocols, clinical practice guidelines. And then we end up down the road weeks later, the patient is not improving, um, has not regained consciousness, and we're keeping them alive with a respirator or feeding tubes. And then people are asking, should they be withdrawn um, or should we have started in the first place? 
So sometimes if we know in advance what a patient will want in certain situations, sometimes we wouldn't make those choices for each condition. So our treatments and tests are the tools of medicine and ethics and the patient's values guide us in their appropriate use. So during our consultations, in these cases in the hospital, we'd review the relevant ethical principles that I just did with you, and then take a step back to see the whole person. So I'd like to, I ask family and friends what their life was like before, how, what were their religious beliefs? Did they ever indicate in the past what they would want in different situations when a loved one or friend went through similar situations? And often we get a lot of clear direction on what the individual would have wanted. We ask about what gave them quality and joy in their life and what kind of a life do you think would be unacceptable from their perspective that they were able to speak from their past selves. So we not only review the medical facts, which the medical team provides, but also those personal and social factors that we rely on with their friends and family members that are involved in the consultation. So the medical facts would be their past medical history, the current medical situation, and their prognosis, what is expected with the different treatment options and what are the risks and benefits of those treatments. So we have the healthcare team provide that information so that there's a clear understanding about the risks and benefits. And then the family and friends kind of share with us what that individual's preference are, what their values were, or what their cultural beliefs are, and where do they get a sense of meaning in life. And again, we ask about any advanced directives, something they put in writing or sent that would guide us in the situation. And of course, who else would be affected by these decisions? So there's, uh, there's current legislation that does allow medical assistance in dying. At the time I chaired in the ethics committee, there was no such thing as a physician or medically as this medical assistance in dying or what they used to call euthanasia. Uh, but it is now legally available, but I'll go through a little bit of detail. And of course, the information is also online through uh, the Ministry of Health and on the federal website for Health Canada as well. So medical assistance in dying is available with certain conditions, particularly a grievous or irremedial medical condition. So someone should be in a great deal of suffering in these conditions and is not amenable to medications and treatments that are accepted by the individual. But that person must be at least 18 years of age and mentally competent. That means capable of making healthcare decisions for themselves. And they have to be um, not visitors to, to Canada, uh, but people that are residents and living here. That individual needs to make a voluntary request for medical assistance in dying. That is not due to pressure from other people. So that's always been a great concern with euthanasia, that an individual might feel pressure from others to, um, to ask for medical assistance in dying. Um, and they must be able to give informed consent, as we have discussed, so that they know the alternatives as well. So it has to be a grievous and irremediable condition. Uh, so it has to be a serious illness or a condition, um, but it, until March 17, 2024, it cannot be a mental condition, such as bipolar disorder or depression. Um, so the government initially was planning to approve uh, mental or emotional conditions that are chronic and grievous and irremediable, uh, but they needed more time to make sure there are enough supports and enough information so we're able to do that. So we have until March 17, 2024 before it includes psychiatric, psychological conditions. So the individual currently needs to be in an advanced state of decline that cannot be reversed. And they must be having unbearable physical or mental suffering from that illness, disease, or disability. And the state of decline cannot be relieved under conditions that are acceptable by the individual. It doesn't have to be a fatal or terminal condition such as cancer, but it has to be, by this definition, grievous and irremediable. 
So to be eligible, you must provide informed consent to a practitioner. And it means you have consented uh, to made after you received all of the following information, the diagnosis, the available forms of treatment, and the available options for relieving suffering, including palliative care, uh, such as medications or other things to relieve the suffering. And you must be able to give informed consent both at the time of the request and immediately before receiving the drug that would cause death. Um, however, there might be some special circumstances. So there is this option for a waiver of that final consent. For example, a patient with cancer might have some decline such that they're no longer able to speak and to convey that information as their disease progresses. But when they're uh, of capability and competence of communicating their decision in advance, there is a waiver they can sign for their final consent. And the reason is people have the right to withdraw their consent at any time and to change their minds because that's so important. So this, the details of waiver of final consent according to the Canadian law is that um, your natural death is reasonably foreseen and that while you do have decision-making capacity or capability, you're assessed and approved to receive medical assistance in dying and your practitioner advise you that you're at risk of losing your capacity to provide that final consent due to your condition. And you made a written arrangement with your practitioner um, in which you consent in advance to receive made on a particular date if you are no longer uh, having that capacity to consent, even on that date. So it's that little out so you, you can waive that need to provide final consent just before the procedure. Okay, so this is this is why they've kind of delayed that that uh, including uh, mental conditions until March 17, 2020, because they postponed it fairly recently. It was actually coming due just last month, so it's going to be a whole year before people with solely mental illnesses um, who meet the criteria for made otherwise could request that. Okay, so a little detail about that waiver of final consent. So any arrangement you might have signed about waive, waiving that final consent would be considered invalid if at the time of the procedure, um, not only do you no longer have the capacity, but you actively demonstrate um, non-verbally uh, refusal or resistance to have it. So either with some words or sounds or gestures. Now this is different from reflexes, that are involuntary, but if there's reasonable indication that you are resisting, that you don't want to have it done, then that would be respected and then they would not proceed with the procedure. So very, very tricky. Uh, so we like to think about these things well in advance and try to foresee what our future health might be based on our present health. So preventive bioethics is what I encourage, just like preventive medicine. So preventing conflicts in the future and anticipating the future. So Jesus was quoted as saying, the kingdom of heaven is everywhere, but men do not see it. And when I was chairing ethics and providing education in our hospital, um, I was quoted as saying, ethics is everywhere, but we just don't see it until we really look for it. So the first key in preventive bioethics is to anticipate the future when you may not be able to make your decisions. So when you might be suffering from a serious condition, but unable to make decisions on your own, because that can happen to any of us. If we're happy to live to old age or the unexpected happens, like an accident or a stroke or a heart attack. Um, so you need to understand the benefits and burdens of resuscitation. That's um, getting the shocks, uh, chest compressions, assisted respirations with a bag and mask or with the machines. You need to understand the good and bad aspects of artificial feeding, either with a feeding tube down our nose or mouth into our stomach or a tube that's placed directly through the skin into our abdomens. And artificial ventilation, which would be a mask that's delivering oxygen blown into our lungs. 
And you need to consider what gives your life meaning and what constitutes a good quality of life. So even if you were to have dementia in the future, you may still enjoy a good quality of life if you were to appreciate the people around you, if you're appreciating and enjoying uh, sensations and foods and other aspects of, of living. And it's really important to communicate your values and your wishes while you can and ensure your family knows what you would want in these different situations. So advanced directives refers to a clear statement about your preferences for medical care. Um, and this is what we can refer to, something in writing that you would sign and date, so that if you're unable to make decisions in the future, this can guide us in knowing what procedures you would want and what procedures you would refuse. And what are the situations you would want or refuse those procedures? And who you would select as your loved one or friend to make those decisions for you? Because sometimes it's not so cut and dry. So you need someone that understands your wishes and would respect them. And when there's gray areas, they would rely on your values and respect them. So you might not wish to have CPR, that's the chest compressions, assisted breathing, the um, defibrillator, or intubation where a tube is put down your throat to provide breathing and respiration if you can't breathe on your own. So you might decide not to have that if you had an irreversible uh, life limiting condition with no hope for a return to an acceptable quality of life. Uh, sometimes it's not so clear cut, so it's hard to decide. And you may not wish to be on mechanical life support if you were in a persistent vegetative state with no hope of recovery. But in other circumstances, you might. So we should always plan in advance and talk it over with family and friends. That's what family dinners are for. And choose someone you know that you can trust to respect your preferences and make sure they know and agree to make that decision for you. And of course, inform your family doctor and put it in writing. So there is an advanced care uh, guide that you can order the PDF. They're available on paper too through the provincial government. So they're on every health authority site like Vancouver Coastal or Fraser Health. So you can go to either of their sites or just Google my voice and you'll get this yellow covered PDF advanced care planning and they can kind of guide you through the process of different scenarios and how to make decisions and how to choose decision makers for you. So it, it helps to have your physician look at it over with you so you can anticipate different things and answer any questions that you have. So it's something we should all consider if we have, as we get older and if we have uh, multiple chronic conditions or have kids that would not agree with one another of what would be best. So it's good to, to save a lot of heartache and make sure your desires and values are respected. So it's useful to, to look at this document and maybe talk it over with your doctor. Um, I'll give some examples of simple advanced directives. If you're going in for an amputation of a toe or a knee surgery, um, I would probably write a little note so that they don't do the wrong leg or extremity. Or if you're going in for a hernia, then I, I would probably uh, do a little get a Sharpie and make sure they don't do the wrong procedure. So this is requesting that the advanced directive to make sure they do the hernia on the right side and not mistakenly give me a vasectomy. So I hope you found this useful. So I've, I've left uh, plenty of time for questions. And I hope Leona can share those with us. And I, I want to invite every one of you and all your friends and family to join us on May 6th on a sunny Saturday morning for my talk on healthy physical activity and how to fit that into your everyday life, which will be soon followed by a really fun and easy walk around Confederation Park in North Burnaby near uh, McGill Library and the Eileen Daly Pool. It's a, a great place. And um, our great mayor always attends these gatherings and he's a big draw. And the fire department usually brings their fire truck that little kids can look at and a yeah. whole bunch of your Burnaby family doctors as well. So hope to see you there. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I did pop, put the um, 
registration link in the uh, chat. And I, I hear Dr. Wong mentioned that there is free gifts for those that register. So make sure you're on the list and come see one of our staff at the, at the event. So I did have a couple of questions come up throughout the talk. Um, the first one's from Teresa. She says, if a doctor in the hospital suggests to remove the life support of a seriously ill patient, can the wife who has no representation agreement refuse the doctor's suggestion? Hmm, that's a tough one and it depends on the condition. So normally um, they would want the consent, consent of the wife because there's some stepwise. So a temporary substitute decision maker is usually the spouse. So if it's the spouse, unless there's something written as opposed, it would be the spouse of an adult that is allowed to make the medical decisions. Um, so it would be the spouse that makes the decision. If the patient would have absolutely no benefit from the life support, then it could be disconnected. It's the same as not having the treatment to start with. So it's not considered medical assistance in dying or euthanasia to remove life support. So if it's really clear cut, like very clear cut that there is no benefit at all, that's actually causing more harm, um, that for example, if a patient is brain dead, and they're not showing any indication of life, except that what we're sustaining by keeping their heart beating and keeping air going to their lungs, then that might be an indication where they can remove it without specific consent. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what are your thoughts on the expansion of MAID? What was your most ethically complex situation you have faced, which you can talk about, and how did you resolve it? Well, probably the most, the, the only difficult consultation, the really difficult one, was the family members that came were suffering from mental illness, uh, actually a psychosis. So that was a difficult one because they, um, even though the patient showed no indication of brain activity, the family members were convinced the individual was sending messages to them through telepathy. So that was a really difficult and challenging one because they, they, the healthcare team ended up having to stop life support because the patient was, but, and, but the family did not understand just because of psychosis, because they were not capable either. Right. And another difficult one was um, when the, um, the individual in the hospital uh, that we're trying to make decisions for actually um, had a caregiver and a relationship with a caregiver living in the same house, but we're not legally married. And of course, the consequence was the children got that individual's property and the person that was looking after him for years um, was all alone and didn't have that decision-making ability. So some tricky things depending on the circumstances. Um, and the expansion of MAID. So that's really difficult because, um, well, just from spiritual and religious beliefs, um, I think life is really sacred. So uh, when we uh, signed up to be healthcare providers, we didn't think we'd ever be um, um, assisting people in ending their lives. So if a patient requests medical assistance in dying, then we respect their wishes. In some cases, it's quite appropriate um, that a patient with a chronic neurodegenerative condition. He has a very clear mind. He was not suffering from depression or anything that can impair his judgment. And he knew that he would continue to decline and suffer more and cause more suffering for his family who had to look after him. And um, I res we definitely respected his decision and did the paperwork and a another physician provided medical assistance in dying. So it was difficult to say goodbye to a beloved patient that I had known for a long time, but to knowing that's what their wishes are. The expansion of me to mental illness is really difficult because people do suffer a lot with um, psychiatric conditions such as depression. But we, we try really, really hard, not just with medications, but with counseling, um, with cognitive therapy, with mindfulness, um, with social activation, trying to reconnect people with 
with life to help them deal with depression. So it's, that's a hard one for a lot of a lot of healthcare providers like myself to. Um, if I have a patient that's depressed, under what conditions and how long would I, I really um, support their desire? But we have to respect their decisions. So when that new law is available, we have to respect if they request it. Um, of course, I won't be doing the procedure, but I would connect with them who they have to, to meet with and what they need to do to, to meet their needs when that becomes the law. So that's, it's gonna be really challenging because it's not, um, and, and I'm worried that people might be impaired because when we are uh, depressed or with a mental illness, um, it does cloud our thinking. We don't see all of the information. Um, I think we all know that if we're grieving, uh, we don't, it's almost like depression. We can see only the negative. We can't see the positives in our life. Everything seems to be empty. And it can be just like that for a longer period of time if we're depressed. That we're, but there are many, many other options. So some people, if medications don't help and lots of counseling doesn't help and reconnecting them socially doesn't help, there's electroconvulsive therapy that is sometimes amazingly effective, but a patient has a right to refuse to do that. So, you know, I would be very upset if a patient could have, we could have done something to improve their quality of life and relieve the suffering and keep them alive at the same time. And I did have a patient that requested MAID. Um, and, you know, I explained to her that the pain she felt from these compression fractures is just short term, but somehow she convinced the doctors that were going to do MAID that this is the reason why she wants to end her life because of that suffering. But I know that she had a very difficult marriage um, and I know that she didn't want to commit suicide, but I know that most of her suffering was actually from the marriage and not from that temporary pain that would get better with pain management. Um, and it wasn't due to spinal stenosis or a chronic condition they couldn't operate on, but just temporary compression fractures that would heal over time. So that was a really difficult one because the patient went off and um, spoke to other physicians and, and had medical assistance in dying. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's really powerful to hear it right from the source of what doctors um, have to go through in some of these difficult decisions that they have to make um, for their patients. So we really appreciate you sharing and I know everyone else um, in the session does as well. I don't have any other questions uh, unless somebody wants to quickly pop, uh, put one in the chat. People are pretty quiet. Yeah, pretty sober. Talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can just talk about walk with your dog again. <laughs> are you going to be bringing your puppy this year? Uh, only if I have an assistant, because I usually uh, have to talk to lots of people. So if my daughter or my wife comes, then they can bring Teddy. We okay. made a special shirt for him the last time. That's right. Came. Yeah. Yes, we have some good photos of that. So. Um, unless there's anything else, folks, um, we, we're finishing early, so enjoy the rest. It's still relatively light out. So um, uh, as I said before, when we close down the session, um, a brief seminar or session uh, survey is going to pop up. It's eight questions. If you want to, if you could answer them, that would be great. Um, and that's all from me. Anything else hey. from you? No, nope, we're all good. So great. Uh, it'd be nice to see you in person. We're we're planning to do our talks in person when we start the new season, at least uh, alternating virtual and in person. That'd be great. That'll be fun. Excellent. Okay, well, everyone have a lovely evening. You too, Dr. Wong. Thanks for your time. And, and thanks, uh, Liliana. hopefully, we'll see you next month, everybody. Okay. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye.